Hey out there Akronites, welcome once again to Around Akron with Blue Green. On this episode, we're going to head over to the University of Akron and check out the Emily Davis Gallery. I'm going to meet up with the Akron Vulcans and talk about futsal here in Akron. While I was at the University of Akron, I decided to meet up with the local producer, director, and educator at the University of Akron, Josh Gippen. Now to kick this show off today, we're going to head down to Canton, to the National First Ladies Library. Now this place is a treasure trove of history on First Ladies of our country. Let's go see what the National First Ladies Library is all about. National First Ladies Library was started by a woman who was helping her own husband's political career and wanted to use women who she felt would inspire all women across the nation, which was First Ladies. So Mrs. Regula would love, love to write and help her husband write speeches and write her own speeches for political campaigning and she wanted to be inspired by quotes and stories of First Ladies. What she found when she started to do this was that she was disappointed in how little she could find about First Ladies, even just on quotes. And that really upset her. And she was a staunch feminist at heart and felt that this was criminal, that there, these women's stories were not being preserved and taken care of. So she started with this idea of just gathering stories. She was just wanting to gather history and knowledge. And she started with a small band of other women and they hired a historian and they started to build this website. This is almost 30 years ago. There was no professional staff, it was just a bunch of people who were very passionate about this cause and wanted to make sure that these stories and, and these legacies were preserved. No one had put together a comprehensive exhibit or space or even a knowledge base for First Ladies until Mrs. Regula decided to do this work and it started to get attention. Even First Ladies themselves didn't try to preserve their own history. So the most famous preservationist of all First Ladies is Jacqueline Kennedy because she did all of that fantastic work to save the, the fabric of everything that the White House was. And it truly changed everything about how the White House functions and what they do now. And it created the White House Historical Association. Even then, First Lady's history wasn't being preserved. It's an amazing opportunity to watch visitors come through the space or have conversations with visitors come through the space, whether it's little children who truly didn't understand how important these women were, or the amazing things that they've done, all the way to senior citizens who thought they knew their history until they come here and they, they don't realize the significance of certain things that had happened even in their own time period until it's explained to them and to watch that aha moment, that light bulb go off and, and it's, such a very, it's such a very powerful thing to see. And then we get to hear them talking and, and what that meant like. Sometimes it's as simple as looking at a textile to look at a dress and to discuss why they wore what they wore and or the colors and um, and what that garment looked like or what that signified and what that meant, you know, to something as complicated as a letter of a first lady who said, you know, don't tell anybody I'm asking you to do this, but there's an injustice being done to another woman that I want rectified, and then it's rectified. And, and no one knows that history because she said she didn't want anyone to know that she did that. And so, but we can share that history now. We looked here at the bank building and it was determined that this was where we were gonna house our library and research facilities. Hence why this building is called the Education and Research Center. So at that point in this early days of the nonprofit, they were really focused on education, intellectual data collection about first ladies, research, and so forth and so on. There wasn't this thought process about being a museum and anything more. So the early blueprints for this, where we are sitting right now, this was going to be a giant library space. And with the second floor feature that you could go up a spiral staircase and have more book holdings. But as time went on and they continued to do work in this building, it was determined, and that's how fast the evolution of this nonprofit was happening, they determined that this was no longer gonna be just a library, that it was also gonna be a museum. Mm -hmm. 
So what we are sitting in right now is an original 1890s bank building for downtown Canton, Ohio. We, from our understanding, the bank actually existed across the street in a shared space. This building was built then in the late 1800s to provide a larger space. It also provided law offices and bankers offices on the upper five floors. And in the lower level of the building was a bathhouse. So the gentlemen would come and as we sort of quip here, that they would come and do their after hours business here at the big building as well. I feel like the work that National First Ladies Library does and the First Ladies National Historic Site is so important to tell the story of, of women who have really shaped our country who've empowered other women to do phenomenal things in big ways in politics and, and advocacy for health and um, well-being of the citizens that live in this country. But I think it's also an empowerment of the unsung heroes and every day in our own backyards of women who are doing fantastic things. And I think that's what we want to celebrate. We want to celebrate that and make sure that those stories go on and on to continue to make women and little girls feel like there's someone out there that they can look up to and um, see as a fantastic role model. Next up, we're gonna head down to the Goodyear Theater and meet up with Otto Orff to talk about the Akron Vulcans. What's that? It's a futsal team. What's that? Let's go see what futsal and the Akron Vulcans is all about. Futsal in general is, if you really look at it at its core, it's street soccer. And all around the world, soccer is a poor person's sport. It's, the, it's every person's sport. I don't want to say specifically poor person sport, but all you need is a ball. And if you look at Africa, actually one of my favorite articles in National Geographic, a friend of mine sent me the insert and it was soccer balls made from anything you can imagine from torn up socks to pieces of plastic to, you know, that were all tied together to make a ball because they, they just didn't have balls in these different countries. And so um, futsal is played in a small space. The word futsal comes from the word football and the word salon put together. It was football de salon in Portuguese, and it was football de salon in Spanish, and then football sala, and then just futsal. They, you know, it's a mashup of those two words. So I would actually say that the word futsal is probably the single thing that hinders the growth of the sport more than anything because it doesn't have anything to do with soccer. And in our country, um, that's confusing for people. So futsal here, after I came back from that, the World Cup, um, my career was ending. I had played professionally indoor and outdoor for 21 years. Um, and I had been doing soccer camps all over Northeast Ohio. When I realized that developmentally, and if you think about this, that when kids are playing in an enclosed area, there's no real premium on passing the ball accurately or putting the proper pace on the ball because it always hit the wall. It's kind of like hockey when you dumped it in the corner and chased and then you could fight for it down there. So I don't want to say it's doing a disservice, but to the average player, it really never forced them to learn to pass accurately if they're playing a lot of indoor soccer. Futsal is definitely different. And if you don't pass the ball to someone, then it goes out of bounds and it's the other team's ball. Without a coach, without a referee, um, you, learn, you know, kids want to play and they want the ball, and they want possession of the ball. So you want to pass the ball accurately and keep the ball. And, and that alone makes it more developmentally productive for, for children. So when I saw that and having doing soccer camps here for so long, I, I kind of shifted my entire career and started a league with one of my former teammates, Chris Dore, um, and we started the Great Lakes Futsal League. And we started up in Parma. Um, he ran a club, I ran a small club, we put our teams in, we opened it up to individual players. And after the first year, we had 75 teams playing in Northeast Ohio. Fast forward a few years later, um, we were expanding to the point where there was more teams in the Canton, Akron area, and we were looking for a venue down here. So we found our first venue, and the second place we moved into was this beautiful building called the Goodyear Hall. But now we have over 400 teams playing in Northeast Ohio, um, from Lorraine, the east side of Cleveland, um, we're in Strongsville, and now down here in Akron at, at our facilities. And we, have, we each have clubs, our club's focus, uh, my club is strictly futsal. His is outdoor and futsal. 
Many of the outdoor clubs have adopted futsal as a winter training option for their players. And now futsal itself um, is really becoming, if you talk to a lot of the best players, if they had an option, they would play futsal all year long. There's just no college opportunities, there's no scholarships, there's no professional futsal yet. So what we decide to do here in Akron is um, I profess to be one of the movers and shakers in the game of futsal across the country. And if you're gonna talk that talk, then we decided we'd walk the walk. Um, one of my former teammates, Nicholas DiCello, um, he said, let's do it. And we basically uh, talked to a few partners, a few business partners. We got the money invested and we decided we're gonna put on a professional show here in Akron. We're gonna start to develop a program where our, our youth players have a place to move into and they can pursue this game at a higher level. And then when professional futsal really hits the United States, we'll be developing American players instead of bringing in foreigners for the sport. Well, there's one thing that I would love to see because it would change, it would change the game, it would change, it would change the entire landscape of the sport, which would be the NCAA bringing it into the fold as a, as a college sport. Because if there were scholarships involved in the game of futsal, and we have universities all across the country with plenty of space, we have interest, the soccer population, the ethnic population of our university is very diverse. These people know the game. Um, that would immediately change the, the game for the better. Kids would start focusing on futsal. We lose a lot of kids at the 15, 16, 17 year old age because the better players are focusing on soccer where they can get a scholarship. Um, but the next level is really what we're we're trying to provide and, and I have a friend who was, I mentioned to you earlier, Keith Tozer, he's the national team coach for 20 years. Um, and now my, my partner, Dushan Yakitsa and Pablo De Silva and myself, we, we recently took over the national team coaching staff, but um, he is the commissioner of the Professional Futsal League, which is owned by Mark Cuban and Donnie Nelson and a couple of other people from the NBA. And that game, when that sport starts, that's gonna give kids a place to aspire to play. And I think ultimately, yes, you can play the game for fun, but you know our country, everybody's looking to be a, a rock and roll star, or a rapper, <laughs> or you know, now, now it's the uh, um, reality television. But sports has always been, you know, athletes, I think people have always aspired to be athletes or followed athletes because it's something that they did and then they see people doing something so well that they've loved that they follow the sport and um, our country is maybe, you know, maybe the best in the world for diversity, which hurts soccer a little bit because our best athletes don't generally choose it. But futsal is on its way. Um, futsal is the X Games version of soccer in our country. And I really think that uh, in the very near future and hopefully in the next five years that you see a big shift in it and it makes it to the collegiate or professional level. Next up, we're gonna meet up with Josh Kippen. Now he's doing an amazing project at the University of Akron, which is crossing many platforms to do some storytelling, some history, some good journalism, just some overall amazing documentary filmmaking. Let's go see what Josh Kippen is all about. I think being here in Akron, or anywhere, as an independent filmmaker, it's important to not be all that independent because we all kind of depend on each other. I think a lot of people have a, a more, I think it's something with artists to be a little bit stubborn and a little bit like this is my vision, this is my voice. Filmmaking is so innately collaborative to begin with and then when you're working on a documentary about a certain issue, a uh, social issue let's say, it's so important to Find those allies. So this project that I'm working on right now at the University of Akron is very interesting. Uh, I was brought on board uh, about a year ago and there is a book being written here in the anthropology department about the bodies buried under Schneider Park. And Schneider Park was part of the Summit County Infirmary, also known as the Poor House. And those bodies buried under there were the poorest of the poor, 
of Akron. They were people who stayed at the poorhouse, and so they were elderly, disabled. And the story that we're telling uh, somewhat is an adaptation of the book, but there's also a play that's being produced by a local theater troupe of people with different degrees of disability and different types of disability. And so they're looking at the history of disability, but they're, and, and by the way, our documentary is called The Forgotten Dead. Their play is called Along the Graveyard Path. And we're producing a newsreel that will kick off their play. So they'll have that on screen at the start of their play. And we're also using excerpts from their play in our documentary. And so very quickly, our documentary starts out asking questions about who are these people buried under this park and why are people walking over them without even realizing playing soccer on top of these bodies, playing football, driving their cars, letting their dogs defecate on top of, imagine doing that in a cemetery because it's a cemetery, but it very quickly becomes a story about who were those people and the fact that they were people with disabilities and how were they treated back in those days. Yeah, I, I think that this class, and I'm not a, you know, I'm not like a professor. That's not what I do for a living, but I hope that my students are learning a lot from this class. I learned practically everything about filmmaking just by doing it. And, and it's so hard, as you well know. It is so difficult. And so being kind of thrown in on a real world project and having to make something for real, for the public, you know, is different than a class. In a classroom, it's kind of like an incubator and you're just kind of experimenting and I'm writing something, but it's just for my professor. Whereas, no, I mean, we have a job to do and I need your help. We're all in this together, we're a team. And so there's a lot of problem solving. Um, whereas in a typical class, you'd say, oh, there's no, there's no stupid questions, there's no bad questions. In, in this class, it's a lot more, the emphasis is, if you don't know how to do it, figure it out. Figure it out. We, you stumbled on a problem, jump over it or, or crawl under it, but figure it out. So not to say that I'm not available. You know, but, but there is more of an emphasis on problem solving. The documentaries that I've produced over the years uh, usually get used in some sort of an educational format, whether it's a classroom or whether it's a group of people coming together working on an issue. Um, the documentary becomes fodder for discussion. So in this case we're talking about disability, the way people with disabilities were treated a hundred years ago, and looking at the way people with disabilities are treated today, and what we still need to change into the future. So that I believe is the strength of, of documentaries. It's a way of getting a message out about an important topic in a way that perhaps a book cannot. I was working on my master's project and I did this documentary, The Raised Machete. And I also wrote a 65 page master's thesis. No one ever read my master's thesis except my advisor. And because that was his job was to read it and to decide whether I could graduate. No one except for him. But the movie we made got used by this farm worker organization in Ecuador. And the movies that I've made over the years, for one thing, they get watched. If you were to look at all of the movies I've made over the years, they've been watched literally by millions of people. I have one video on YouTube in particular about pregnancy, which has been viewed by, uh, I think it's around two million people. So, impact. Documentaries have impact. Um, books have their place. And I'm never, gonna, I'm never gonna sit here and tell you that there's not a place for books, but you can reach a broader audience. That's the power of documentary. And you can make change. 
Now to wrap this show up today, we're going to head over to the Emily Davis Gallery at the University of Akron. Now, if you're an art aficionado, a collector, or you just like to go see some amazing stuff, you're going to want to check this place out. Let's go see what the Emily Davis Gallery is all about. I was lucky and I had really great art teachers in elementary school and it was just part of our, our lives, music, visual arts, theater. So it was something that was, that was there um, and I, I remember entering a contest and winning, sort of designing a, um, a banner. Uh, and I, I just loved, you know, the idea of designing something and creating something and, and did it my, my, my whole young life without sort of thinking about it as a, as a career uh, until college, really. I think a lot of people don't understand that the, the curation of art is difficult and that it's not just like oh I like that artist let's put on a show you know you, you could do that uh, but to do something that's thoughtful or to do something that um, is meaningful especially to our students here on campus take some real thought and and placing work in a space is also something that I've spent my whole career doing and it's not easy and it's it's kind of overwhelming to be given artwork especially in an exhibition like this one with we have over 50 artists and, and nearly 100 objects in here um, trying to make sense of them. And if you can't make sense of them as someone who's, who's establishing how an exhibition could flow, the public won't make sense of it either. Um, and sometimes you don't know when you walk into a gallery and you get a feeling from it. That has been, that has been very carefully you know, placed uh, in, in front of you, that you are uncomfortable or that you're excited or that you're surprised by the color or something. Someone's thought about that pacing or that connection or that that is hung with that. And I think a lot of people just sort of think it just pops up on the wall. And there's usually a, a lot of people in, involved uh, and it's work to do this and it's uh, good work. There are preparators and registrars and curators and art historians that are all involved in the, the management of exhibition spaces all over you know, the world. So it's, it's also a career choice. Emily Davis was an art teacher and head of the art department uh, at the University of Akron in the 1940s through the uh, early 70s. And by all accounts from people who she hired and students that worked with her, she was a force to be reckoned with and was um, described as pugnacious, a bulldog, a chain smoking, you know, uh, you know, person who hired everybody who then developed the department for 30 years. So she was a major force here on campus for a long time. And when the university expanded, especially in the late 60s, when it became part of the state university system and really grew both as an art department and as a university as a whole, she was hiring everybody, turning it into an actual department of art. She was the director of it. And when she resigned, there wasn't a, a gallery for the students, a separate gallery. And the students demanded one. And when they got it, which was a small 19th century building across Exchange Street from where we are now, a little old, what had been a barber shop, they also uh, insisted that it be called um, Emily Davis in her honor. And so it, that, that name has stuck with the gallery as it's traveled over here into the, this, what was the new building in the mid 1980s. Well, current students, um, if we're talking about the state of current art for younger people, um, they're all digital natives. So their, their, their visual awareness came via screens. And instead of uh, a lot of them, instead of being sort of married to those screens when they get to art school, they are embracing analog. They are making photographs uh, the traditional way like they were done in the 1930s. They are working with you know, paper and paint. And, and really embracing uh, collage and, and physical elements because I think it's something that was really kind of missing oftentimes, you know, and the thing that they looked to sort of, it had this sort of, it's, it's flowing back and forth between a real fascination with uh, artificial intelligence or, you know, pure digital and then sort of a re-embracing of, of analog uh, and traditional techniques. So they they're, are, are aware of it and, and able to do all of it, which I'm, I'm really jealous of their, um, you know, the, the toolbox that they have available to them. In 
it makes a huge difference for some people just to legitimize what they're doing. Um, and oftentimes that means someone else deciding that it's good enough to be on a wall, uh, especially in a public setting. And that sometimes that's all it takes for also not only for the, the family, but for the student themselves to see themselves, oh, I can do this, I can do this for a living, or I, I am worthy of, of being in the conversation with my peers or with my faculty or with other people in the region. And sometimes it takes sort of someone else saying, yeah, you know, this is really interesting. I see something in this. And that, um, that can be a real boost. It can really change someone's uh, idea of themselves. Thank you once again for watching this episode of Around Akron with Blue Green. Now, if you have any questions or comments, you can reach me at www.aroundakronwithbluegreen or engage me on Facebook and on Instagram. And remember, in these trying times, remember to be kind, compassionate, and caring. I love you. You matter. Thank you so much and have an amazing day.